Welcome to worship this morning. Um, we're so thrilled to be here um, inside this cool sanctuary. It's a nice place to be. Um, don't forget a couple of announcements. Tonight we're having a um, farewell dinner for Pastor Jimmy. Many of you know Pastor Jimmy has taken a job at a different church, and he was here with us for about 20 years. So um, we want to thank him tonight, and we're having a dinner for that purpose. And we'd love for you to come back about 6 o'clock for that. Um, be in prayer this week, as it says in the bulletins, for our teachers, those um, folks that are going back to school this week. Um, we won't call out any people wearing black this morning, but, um, but it's really a struggle. The summer's over for some of those folks. Uh, but be in prayer for them and for our schools. And coming up pretty soon on a Wednesday night, we'll do our prayer for the schools um, traveling around and staying here, all that kind of thing. So, um, so welcome again to worship. We're thrilled to have you. to felt when David stood to face Goliath on a hill I imagine that he shook with all his might until you took his hand and held on tight cause you were there you were there in the midst of danger's snare you were there you were there always you were there when the hardest fight seemed so out of reach oh you were there you were always there you were always there So there he stood upon that hill. Abraham with knife in hand was poised to kill. But God in all his sovereignty had bigger plans. And just in time, you brought a land. Cause you were there, you were there In the midst of the unclear You were there, you were there always You were there when obedience Seemed to not make sense Oh, you were there You were always there you were always there. So haven't I learned that my ways aren't as high as yours are? And you alone keep the universe from crumbling into dust. You are God and the not have understood you there you were hanging blameless on a cross you would rather die than leave us in the dark every moment every plan coincidence just all makes sense with your last breath cause you were there you were there during history's darkest hour you were there you were there always you were the victor and the king you were
you say, I believe that that song was made for you. Praise be. What a powerful song. And in the interest of our having um, just sung as a congregation in his time, I would like to ask you to find this colored book in front of you, this hymn book, and turn toward the back to the responsive reading, number 689. Did you find that? 689. And um, I'll read the light print and ask you to respond with the dark print. This is a confession of faith and belief and a solidarity with the Word of God. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. Just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. We wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a collage from uh, Matthew and uh, Revelation, to be sure, and Hebrews, I think. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, to the receptivity of the eternal, immutable, flawless, and powerful word of God. Amen. I... um, I want to tell you a very short story. The 3rd Infantry Division, headquartered Fort Stewart, Georgia, has a combat engineer element, and a platoon sergeant of that combat engineer platoon by the name of Sergeant First Class Paul Smith. Sergeant Smith was given the task of providing security for a walled compound area just outside the Baghdad airport while the full assault was going on during Operation Desert Storm. They were bringing wounded into this walled compound and his 36 men set up security around it. Others were helping to bring the wounded in And oddly, they were also bringing in Republican Guard prisoners to the same compound. Sentries called out to Sergeant Smith that there was a smoke, a smoke column forming and coming from the north toward the compound where the prisoners were and uh, where more wounded U.S. and British troops were. Sergeant Smith put on field glasses and got a look at it, and to his horror, it was a large element of Iraqi Republican Guard, heavily armed, coming right for that compound. They were too far away for small arms fire, which is all that the engineers had, except for one damaged armored personnel carrier with a 50 caliber machine gun, a reach out and touch somebody weapon, He got up on the top of the damaged personnel carrier and he ran it through the concrete wall. Just pushed the wall over so that it was that personnel carrier facing the oncoming Republican Guard. He then ordered a specialist to bring ammo in large quantities to that personnel carrier. And the uh, 
specialist did his job. He brought the ammo up in large quantities. Sergeant Smith started barking orders for all of his men to help the wounded out of the compound. And he would stay there with the disabled personnel carrier and the one specialist as an arms bearer, ammunition carrier, and barrel changer when it gets too hot. He started attriting the Republican guards at a long distance with the 50 caliber machine gun. They kept coming, they kept closing. He kept firing, they swapped out a barrel, brought in additional ammunition, he kept firing again. And then he told the specialist to run. Get out of here. I'll cover for you. And for all that are trying to put some distance between the invading Iraqi Republican Guard and the wounded and <coughs> oddly prisoners. The corporal objected, or the specialist did, the E-4 objected, and Smith said, that is an order, leave this position. They'll kill you. I'll buy you some time. And he fired, and he fired, and he fired, until the incoming fire was just too overwhelming, and he was killed. President George Bush, number 43, held a posthumous Medal of Honor ceremony for him at the White House for his wife and his young son of about seven or eight years old. The conditions of the Medal of Honor were extreme valor witnessed unmistakably by multiple eyewitnesses. And the honor of that award has been since the Revolutionary Army of the American Revolution. Had Sergeant First Class Smith survived, generals would be required to salute him if they saw that medal on his uniform, dress uniform. They would salute him. The honor earned by Jesus will have no boundaries one day. There will be no limits to it one day. And we who know him will salute him with gratitude. As a matter of fact, some will salute by compulsion. The salute of bended knee and loosed lips. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, this is a faithful saying and it is worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus has come into this world to save sinners. That was his mission. That he would not be dissuaded from accepting. In humanity, you and I, all of us, have solidarity in this sober fact. We have been slain by sin. We are dead in trespass and sin. I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians and the first chapter if you can. And if you don't have a Bible, there might be one in front of you. How about it, Dave? Are there, there are Bibles in the pew pockets. And if not, follow along on your device. And if not that, then... Just listen very carefully to a very powerful brace of scripture. Ephesians 2, the second chapter. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Did you know that there is a Holy Spirit, and that there are contrary spirits? There's a passage of scripture that's very clear about that. 
a spirit now working in the sons of disobedience, a Holy Spirit that works in the sons of obedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the same mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Before Christ, we are identified as children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and by the way, both are gifts. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, that is, good works. Therefore remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh that are called circumcision, by what is called uncircumcision, that is, by those that are called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants and of promise, having no hope, and you were without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were afar off and to those that were near, the Jews and the Gentile world. Through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. May the Lord add his blessing to that reading as well. We have solidarity in sin, and therefore we have been slain by sin. We are dead in trespasses and sin, dead hopelessly lost in this world without Christ Jesus, the chief cornerstone. Charles Spurgeon was a great Baptist pastor in England, and he said, Jesus did not come to make bad men good. Jesus came to make dead men live. That's how stark and how plain it is. You know, Wednesday night, I've mentioned on a couple of occasions, maybe I hope, that biblical death, by definition, is not separation of the soul from the body because the heart doesn't beat anymore. Biblical death is separation of the soul from God because of sin. On the occasion of the first sin. Jesus is very precise about that. He said, He that believes is not condemned, but he that believes not <clears throat> is already condemned. Dead men walking. Jesus came to this planet on a deadly, high stakes rescue mission. 
He came to seek and to save those that were lost that had no other spiritual remedy. We without Christ were spiritually dead, eternally condemned people. There is no ambiguity there. That is Christianity 101. You and me, all of us, we have solidarity in sin, and without Christ we are slain by sin. Unless we would happen to accept the rescue, he calls, and we call upon the one who is calling for us. There's nothing really meritorious in that. It is obedient. If I were to fall off the deck of an aircraft carrier into the sea, and they rescued me, I would have no notion that I rescued myself. I would be glad for those that rescued me. And that's where Jesus comes in. Without Jesus reigning in our hearts, we're dead in need of and eligible for heaven's response to our need. Heroic intervention of God himself. Because we're slain by sin. And if slain by sin, that would necessitate that that rescue be carried off by God himself. We cannot rescue ourselves. We are, in the words of the apostle, saved by grace. Saved by grace. That's why John Newton wrote of amazing grace that would save a wretch like him or a wretch like Ed or Barbara. Stan, Harold, any of you, all of us. It's amazing grace that would seize us, rescue us, and seal us for all of eternity. Grace may be understood as our getting something unspeakably wonderful in the positive that we never earned and we had no capacity of earning that we have no right to, no title deed to, no hope in that is reasonable. Without Christ, we are hopeless, and we are helpless, and we cannot remedy our situation. We dug ourselves into it, and we cannot get out of the hole. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a... <clears throat> I'm speaking like a, a frog with a man in his throat. When I was in high school, I read a story, an allegory called Pilgrim's Progress. And the pilgrim was a man named Christian. And Christian was on a journey from someplace to someplace. He was seeking the celestial city. Problem is, he falls in a pit. Now that he's in the pit, he can't get out of the pit. He cries out for help. And ultimately, eventually, help shows up. A Christian might have said, what is your name? Well, my name is Help. I've come to help you to get out of the pit. And Christian gets out of the pit, and he's walking along with help toward the celestial city. And help stands, of course, for the Holy Spirit. And Christian says, why is this pit not filled in? And help says, that pit can't be filled in. It must be escaped from with help. During Desert Storm, we had some peacekeepers, some MPs and some reservists that were in a convoy and they were captured by the Iraqi army. They were imprisoned and there was one cute little girl, lady, soldier, from West Virginia. 
a reservist that was called up for the war. I don't know what her job was, what her specialty was, but she was taken prisoner. Her name was Jessica Lynch. Remember Jessica Lynch? Well, the American special operations people were not going to stand for them being imprisoned. They were going to capture the captors and turn the captives free. When they busted into Jessica Lynch's little tent, a Green Beret had to shake her to get her to wake up to say, follow us, you're going home, you're going to safety. That's kind of the way it is for us in a lot of ways. We just need that kind of shaking, that kind of waking up in order to follow him, but he's already ordered. And we need to simply say, yes, I will. Indeed, I will. Grace is that wonderful spiritual reality that separates Christianity from all other well-meaning world religions. Grace, grace, amazing grace. God's amazing grace defines him as loving. Defines him as committed. Available. In touch. Desirous of our company now and forever. He loves us and wants us to be with him. God does not want to give us what we deserve. When grace is rejected, what is left is justice. And justice gives us what we deserve when we do not avail ourselves of God's amazing grace. We should want no part of that. God wants to, and this is staggering to think of this, God wants to give us not what we deserve, he wants to give us what Jesus deserves. Allow me to read <coughs> from the book of Romans, just four verses of scripture. Brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You're adopted by the Heavenly Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we're children of God. And if we're children then we are heirs. We are heirs of God and we are joint heirs with Jesus the Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together with him. Joint heirs with Jesus the Christ. He who spared not his own son, but Instead, he delivered him, that is Jesus, up for all of us. How shall he, that is God, not with him, that is Jesus, also freely give us all things? Joint heirs with Jesus. I think that that is very cool. I was on an airplane years ago. <coughs> it was an empty airplane. It was being ferried from Dallas to Orlando. And I got on it because, well, I had my reasons. I got on the airplane to be ferried. That's all that they had. That's all I wanted. Can you imagine? You're the only one on the airplane? That's great. Just as we're getting ready to go, here comes one more person on the airplane. And he's a dark-complected guy. And... Uh, Looked to be Middle East to me, and I had been praying for fellowship. I had been in a place I didn't want to be for way too long, and I was just like a sponge wrung out. 
And I wanted some fellowship, so I said, Lord, bring me some fellowship. That would be really cool. But the airplane is empty. And then here comes this guy. I said, huh, there's my answer to prayer. So he comes walking down the aisle, and I'm sitting on an emergency row, of course. He looks at me, and he asks the dumbest question. He says, is this seat available? That's, I mean, there were three seats, and I said, yeah, they're all available. <coughs> so the flight attendant brought us each a meal, and I, I prayed over my meal, and he says, uh, when I came up, I knew he was staring at me, and I thought, that's odd. He's here to give me fellowship. And he was staring at me. I knew it. I could feel it. And I was done giving thanks, and he said, you pray to Allah. I said, Lord, what have you sent me? No, I'm not praying to Allah. I'm praying to the Lord God Almighty, the only one that's been or ever shall be, the real one, God. That's who I'm praying to in the name of Jesus who made it possible. He said, Jesus, I said, yes, Jesus, the Son of God, V, exclusive, singular, Son of God. He said, no, I follow the prophet Muhammad. I'm thinking, wonderful. I prayed for fellowship. And this isn't exactly how I would have planned it, Lord, but here it is. Here we are. Let's do this. And I said something about, but the Bible reveals Jesus to be the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God who laid down his life for us. And he says, the Bible? No, 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 I say the Quran. And I would say something about heaven is only available through Christ. And he would say, well, you mean paradise? No, I don't. I mean heaven. I mean Jesus. I mean the Bible. I mean God the Father. These are the things that I mean. Everything that I said, he had an answer for. He was a missionary from Islam to the University of Texas. A well-spoken, articulate, deep-thinking young man. And we went on and on and just back and forth, and I said, you know what? You've got an answer for everything that I say, and I accept that respectfully, even though I don't agree with anything. But here's something that I've got that I want to tell you about. See if you have an answer for this. How do you hope to go to paradise? He said, well, I want to follow the noble path, and I want to honor the teachings of Muhammad the prophet, and I want to pray toward Mecca or Medina five times every day, and I want to honor the elders, and I want to give tithes of all that I possess. I said, oh, do you honor all the elders all the time? Well, most of the time. You worry about that? Yeah, sometimes I worry about that. Do you tithe always under all circumstances? Precisely? Most of the time. I said, do you worry about that? And yes, yes, I worry about that. Do you pray five times every day toward Mecca or Medina? And he thought, and he was quiet, and I said, have you prayed five times today? He said, why do you ask? I said, what if this plane goes down? Will you have prayed five times? No. Do you always, every day, almost always? He was very observant. But you don't do it always. I try to. I mean well. I said, oh. And you hope to go to paradise because you mean well? Yes. I said, you know, I, I'd be very worried if I were you. I'd be very uneasy. He said, I am very uneasy. I said, aha. Now we have a difference. I'm not uneasy at all. I already know it is settled. I've not done well enough, nor is it within me to do well enough to earn heaven. So I place my faith in Christ Jesus, who has done perfectly 
every day, every minute of every hour of every day of every year, perfectly without flaw. My faith is in him. He's done well enough and he purchases my entrance into heaven. I'm relaxed. I'm having fun. And you're worried sick. He said, this is something that I have no answer for. This is something that I would like to know more about. And at the university, there is a woman that has testament that is new in my language. I will read and find out more about Jesus. We do not believe these things about him. I said, you've been taught wrong, my friend. Very wrong. And that is a major distinction, is it not? Absolutely. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Well, <clears throat> when President Bush, 43, gave the Congressional Medal of Honor, he walked up to Paul Smith's son, about this tall. And President Bush was very gracious. He got down like this and he looked at the young man. He stared at the young man and then he said, my stars, you are the spitting image of your dad. And then he hung the Medal of Honor around his neck. You are the spitting image of your dad. And he got the Medal of Honor. You know, when we are saved by grace, a phenomena happens. We become strangers no more. I refer you to verse 19. <clears throat> Therefore, you are no longer strangers, you are no longer foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You are no longer a simple sojourner, a stranger to the things of God, you are fellow citizens of the kingdom of God in the regal family. You are heaven bound. Members of God's household. Adopted children by the Holy Spirit. Presented to God the Father to be your eternal father. You are welcomed in. You are engrafted in. You are a part of God's eternal family. You are loved. You are accepted. You are forgiven. You can be nurtured. You are cherished. He wants to embrace you. He desires you forever. But without Christ, we remain as strangers and foreigners. <clears throat> that truth was part of the heart of the promise that was made to the thief that was crucified before Jesus. And he asked Jesus if he would be remembered when he entered into the kingdom of God. Lord Jesus, I, I think you're going to die. You're not coming down off that cross. But when you die, it's just begun. Would you allow me to be remembered when you come into your kingdom? Jesus said to that penitent thief, this day you will be with me in paradise, the real paradise. You and me, forever, battle buddies, family, forever. Without faith in Jesus, we are strangers. Consult Matthew 7. Many will come to me in that day and they'll confess their spiritual resume. I've been casting out demons, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I have not experienced you. But to the simple penitent thief on the cross, you and me, we're going to be forever together. There's a big difference in those two realities. After we're born again, we're family. Not a stranger anymore. Not a foreigner anymore. Sons and daughters of God himself, adopted forever. No longer strangers to hope. No longer aliens to security. No longer foreigners to heaven. No longer separated and outsiders to blessings. Part of the family. 
There was a young man struggling to get through college. His grades were awful. He didn't care all that much. He was a ne'er-do-well. He was just there to pass the time, spend mom and dad's money. But while there, he met a lovely young creature and he fell head over heels in love with this girl. And he got to know her and he started dating her and she was willing to date him and he couldn't believe his good fortune. He's just getting deeper and deeper in love with this girl and finally he pops the question. And she says, well, I'd love to marry you, but I am going to respect my father. You're going to have to go to my father and ask for my hand in marriage and you're going to have to seek his blessing. And my dad is kind of scary. He's a very powerful man. Very powerful. He owns oop, corporation. I'll do that. I'm in love with you. So he goes to the dad and he says, I love your daughter and I believe your daughter loves me. And she tells me that I need to ask for her hand in marriage. And I need to ask for your blessing. Will you allow me to marry your daughter? Well, if she loves you, she sees something in you, and I will grant her hand in marriage to you. Great! Son, it's better than you thought. I own a major multinational corporation. You are going to be a full partner. Uh, what's that mean? You're going to be a full partner in everything, son. Report to the executive office building, such and such address in Dallas. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, come into the executive chambers and we'll be waiting for you. You're going to be an executive and a full partner in my corporation. Well, now, sir, uh, I never really did real well in college. And, sir, I really don't have much confidence and... Uh, I don't believe I can make decisions and do that heady stuff that executives do. Well, okay, son. Then maybe, I tell you what, I'll let you manage one of my factories. Well, now, sir, factories are kind of noisy, and there's always some dust and all flying around in the air, and that wouldn't be good for me, and uh, uh, I don't know how to make decisions under stress, and, you know, I... Long hours in a factory, I just don't know about I don't believe I can do that. Well, now, son, you won't be an executive and you won't be a manager. Tell you what we'll do. We'll put you in sales. You don't have to worry about people. You sit on the phone. Well, I'm ADHD, sir, and uh, I don't believe I could concentrate and stay on the phone all day. Son, you're a full partner in this business. How in the world can I help you? He said, well, you could buy me out. Now think about that. <laughs> now make spiritual application to that. Are we not redeemed in Christ Jesus? Are we not having set before us privileges of service? And what right have we to say we can't do that? We're ill-equipped to do that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm telling you, there are a lot of implications to be in a part of the family of God. To be in fully adopted and credentialized as a child of God. Residency, the new Jerusalem. In heaven with a new name. How about that? Well, two more things but very quick. When we are saved by God's grace, we become strangers no more to the covenants. To heaven, to the person of God. And we become what I would call saints for keeps. Saints for keeps. God wants you to know something, and God wants us to experience something, what it means to be a saint for keeps. We are redeemed, said Paul, to a glorious inheritance of a saint. A saint. What? What? A saint. Here's some news. Did you know that it is not the church's responsibility to declare who a saint is? who the saints are. It is God's responsibility. And God has already declared that those that belong to Jesus belong to the family and are already separated. We are saints and we are saints for keeps. Fellow citizens of the household of God. 
of the kingdom of God, adopted members of God's household, joint heirs with the Lord Jesus, and we are saints. Now that sounds pretty cool. If I'm tempted for something sordid and something that would be disappointing in heaven, something that would disrupt my testimony, I just need to turn around and say, nope, not going to do that, not going to go there. I am a saint. I'm a child of God. I live in heaven already from God's perspective. God so loved me that he gave the Lord Jesus. Not going to do that. Not going to corrupt myself. I'm a saint. Folks, humanity had no chance of eternity with God without Jesus. To a person, we are slain by sin. We have dug our own grave. We do not have it within ourselves to get out of that grave. We need help from above. There is a Redeemer. Our being slain in sin and in a horrible pit necessitates salvation by grace. A rescue by God's good grace and his regal heart, his sacred heart. By which we become strangers no more and we also become saints for keeps. The responsibility for all of this good that befalls us falls squarely on the shoulders and exclusively on the broken will of King Jesus to give himself for us. Jesus Christ is Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, he was really real. He was also Jesus of eternity. In other words, he really came from heaven. He is really divine. He is the Lamb of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that. Ultimately, we need to do it willingly while the sun is shining and the red breasted robins are singing. He is the hands down winner of the celestial medal of honor. And though we be kings, though we be saints, though we be priests, though we be adopted children of God, we still gladly salute that hands-down winner, Jesus of eternity. Amen? Amen? We should. That's Theology 101. Slain by sin. You agree with that? That necessitates that we be saved by grace. You agree with that? When we're saved, we're rescued, we're spared, we automatically become strangers no more to the household of God, to the good things of God, to the eternity of God, He's already remembered us when he's come into his kingdom. And until then, we're saints and ambassadors, children of the king. You know, there's only two types of people in this room today. Those that are and those that can be. The arm of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not dull that it cannot hear the prayer of desperation and surrender. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm not much different from anyone else. I am a sinner. Lord Jesus, I don't have it within me to do anything about it. Paul said, there are none that are righteous. No, not one. That includes me and it includes you. We are desperately in need of salvation by grace, and it's a gift. And the capacity to exercise that gift is called faith. It's also a gift. The means by which we become forgiven is Jesus Christ, also a gift. We have to accept. Every contract has two pieces, offer and acceptance. The offers on his side of the ledger. The acceptance is on our side of the ledger. But not a cheap grace. Oh, not at all. We determined that we're going to become new creations in Christ Jesus, following the Holy Spirit with the people that are like-minded. We're going to find forgiveness. We are going to have contrition for our sin. 
mortal agony over being so offensive to God. We're going to look for solution and help from above. We're going to declare our intention to serve Christ Jesus for all and with all who will do the same. Father, I thank you for your good love. I thank you for inspiring Paul to write what he wrote in Romans, in Ephesians, for John to write what he wrote in the book of Revelation declaring the same. I thank you, Father, for these people of Parkland so faithful, so yearning, so available for a touch of your grace. I pray, dear Lord, in the name above all names that you will touch and fill our hearts right now. I pray, dear Lord, that you see faith rising right now. I pray that you see someone coming to the end of a journey of sin with a quest for righteousness, a thirst for forgiveness. May it be so, not only here, but all over the Father's world, wherever they meet, beneath the steeples in this world, I pray that the recording angel is writing new names in the book of life. May it be so, dear Lord, I pray. We pray. We'll always pray. In the name above all names, King of kings, Lord of lords, righteous winner of the celestial medal of honor. I pray in his name. Amen.